All right, take your Bibles this morning, go to Numbers chapter 22. We're dealing with part three on the nothings of priorities. We've been looking at the life of a prophet. His name was Balaam and the king of Moab, who was Balak. And in Numbers chapter 22, verse 10 through 17, we were reading about what took place between these two men. King Balak came to to Balaam, and he wanted the prophet to curse the nation of Israel. He was uh, he was the king of Moab, and he was worried about all the Hebrews that were nearby, and he wanted uh, Balaam to curse them. And so uh, uh, Balaam consulted the Lord, and God told Balaam, he says, don't you dare curse those people. Those people are blessed. Those are my people. So Balaam uh, told the princes that had come to see him, he told them, uh, he says, uh, uh, I can't go with you guys. Uh, I can't do what you're asking me to do because the Lord refuseth me to give leave to go with you. He told me not to go with you at all. So those princes went back to King Balak. They reported to Balak, and he upped the ante. He was not satisfied with that answer, so he sent more delegations back, bigger, more important people, more uh, upping the offer to try to persuade Balaam to curse the people. In fact, he says in Numbers uh, 22, 16, he says, Let, the king said, Let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me, for I, I'll promote thee unto very great honor, and I, I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. The king would not give up. He was persistent. So what we have been taking from this, we're looking at these men's lives. We're looking at the persistence of King Balak and how he just would not give up. And what we did, we started looking at the same pattern that Satan used on Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 4. Satan is very persistent. In fact, take your Bible, go to Matthew chapter number 4. And we started last Sunday night looking at how Satan tried to tempt the Lord Jesus Christ. And, of course, he, first of all, he tried to use uh, appetites, and uh, abilities of the Lord and try to get the Lord to compromise that way. And, uh, of course, the Lord uh, did not yield, not, did not give in. And we are looking at this pattern of Satan because he uses the same pattern on you and me. Okay? That's why we're looking at this. So look at Matthew chapter 4 now. Look at verse 5 through 7. We see temptations over the attentiveness and the ability of God. Matthew 4, verse 5 through 7. Then the devil taketh him up, that's taking up Jesus, into the holy city and setteth him on, on a pinnacle of the temple. That's one of the high points of the temple. And saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it's written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So we're going to pray and we're going to get into this. Lord, thank you again for the day. Lord, help us as we look into this portion of Scripture to find insights that will help us to understand how Satan tries to work on us and how he tries to destroy us and try to ruin us and tempt us. Lord, help us to be on our guards as Christians against the wiles of Satan. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Satan, you need to understand this. Satan does not give up easily. If he is defeated in a battle, he does not go into a corner and pout and say, I can't do anything right at all. He doesn't do that. He doesn't go, boo-hoo-hoo, wah, wah, wah. He doesn't do that. His attitude is not, oh, woe is me. Uh, I'm no good. No, he looks at another way to defeat the person he's trying to ruin, trying to destroy, trying to mess up. Of course, he's wanting to do that to you and me. 
Uh, his I've got to be number one attitude is what got Satan into trouble in the first place, and it keeps him motivated. The devil tested and tempted Jesus in the areas of appetite, ability, ambition, authority, adoration, and now in the areas of attentiveness and the ability of God the Father to protect and to care for Jesus. Jesus was led to the pinnacle of the Jewish temple for this temptation. Jesus rebuked Satan. You know what that tells me? We can say no to him. You have the power to say no. You have the power to resist him because James told us to resist the devil. He wouldn't have told us that if we couldn't do it. Jesus rebuked Satan and had told him, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Well, Balaam, he ignored God's authority by disobeying the Lord. He also believed that he could care for himself and meet his needs better than relying on God to meet his needs. He believed that disobeying God to gain honor and money would satisfy him when in reality it ended up destroying him. Now beware of Satan's lies and his deceptions. Now the third area of temptation deals with ambition and authority. Look at Matthew Chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. So Satan not only tempted the Lord Jesus Christ, in the area of his appetites and abilities, but also in the area of ambition and authority. The devil thought this. He thought that he had something very special that would be an enticement to Jesus Christ. Satan led the Lord up into a high mountain, which the Lord created, and showed Jesus all the world's kingdom in an instant. Uh, notice he took the Lord to a high place. Now what did Satan want him to do? He wanted Jesus to fall down and worship. When on the pinnacle of the temple, he wanted Jesus to jump off. He wanted him to jump off or fall down from that pinnacle to, uh, down to the valley below. Now that is Satan's direction and his desire for your life. He wants you to fall down. He, he took Jesus to a high place to get him to fall and to worship. Not to worship God. He wanted Jesus to worship him. We are reminded here that many people have found that the more successful or famous that they become, the greater the temptation they face in those high places. Now when we look at Balaam, Satan used King Balak to cater to his ambition and it defeated Balaam. Now there's something else we want to see here. Look at Matthew 4 verse 8 through 10 again. Here we see temptations over adoration. And the devil taketh them up into exceeding high mountain, showeth them all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, Saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan. Uh, in the Mattoon translation, Get out of my face, okay? Get out of here. For it's written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only thou shalt serve. Satan tempted the Lord in the area of adoration. He promised the Lord, You can have everything if you will worship me. <laughs> that, that really didn't entice Jesus because he already had everything. In fact, the tense of the verb worship indicates that Satan's proposal did not require the worship of Jesus to be a repeated action. Once would be just fine. He was just saying, just, 
Just worship me once. That's all he's asking here, okay? This is the old deception, the old game plan of the devil that says, you only have to just give in once. Many times temptations come in this form. Temptation says, well, just try it once. One little compromise will not hurt you. In reality, one time can do great damage, hurting you and hurting other people. You know, Balaam made this mistake by giving into the offers of King Balak. He just kept up the ante, up the ante, and up the ante, and finally Balaam gave in. You know, the four areas of temptation that were used against Jesus are the ones that Satan uses against you and me too, okay? Jesus understands what it means to be tested or tempted because he faced it from Satan himself. And, of course, he was victorious every time. You know, getting his own way was a priority to King Balak of Moab. He wanted to get his own way. He told Balaam, let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me. Don't let anything stand in your way. His words are an echo of Satan's message too. Come to me. Do what I want you to do, the devil says. He gave the same message to Jesus and to even Eve in the Garden of Eden. King Balak used pressure, persuasion, popularity, possessions, and prestige to get Balaam to compromise and to reconsider his initial refusal to his offer. King Balak's priority made him desperate as well as selfish. He had to have his way no matter what the cost. It was a matter of urgency to him because he was in panic mode. You know, a guy named Stephen Covey said this. He said, most of us spend too much time on what is urgent and not enough time on what is important. That describes the king of Moab. When your desires grip your life, I just got to have it, I just got to have it. When those things grip your life, you do not want anything standing in your way in getting them. And that was true of King Balak, but it was also true of Balaam. Both men made decisions because their desires and their priorities, they were selfish and they were wrong. And by the way, those priorities would eventually leave them with nothing. In fact, it was King Solomon who said, Hope deferreth, maketh the heart sick, but when the desire cometh, it's a tree of life, Proverbs 13:12. So let me ask this morning, do, do your priorities make you desperate and selfish? Are other people hurt by your priorities? Do you spend too much time on what is urgent instead of what is really important in your life? Are you permitting urgent matters to crowd out that which is important? You know, there's something else we want to see in the words of King Balak, who said, let nothing hinder thee. When we look through this chapter, we find that the biggest thing that was hindering Balaam was God himself. God was hindering Balaam. God told Balaam to not go with them and don't curse Israel. The point I'm making here is that sometimes God may hinder us to slow us down or in mercy protect us from making a very stupid decision in our life. God sometimes has to protect us from ourselves. How many of you understand what I just said? Sometimes we, sometimes we are our biggest enemy. We do things that hurt us and destroy us. We choose the wrong path in our life, which messes up our life. And let me ask, is the Lord in mercy trying to hinder you right now from wrecking your life or making a decision 
that will hurt you or others around you. Notice David's desire in Psalm 19, verse 13. He said this. David said, Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. David asked God, Lord, keep me back from sin. Help me not to do what's wrong. In fact, that phrase, keep back, is from the word kasak. It's a Hebrew word, kasak. And it means to restrain, to keep or hold in check. David was asking for God's restraint over his life. You know, in Genesis, we find that God hindered Abimelech from sinning against God and marrying Sarah, Abraham's wife, after Abraham had lied to Abimelech. Genesis 20, verse 3, But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said unto him, Behold, thou art but a dead man, for the woman which thou hast taken, she is a, she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her and said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she is my sister. And she even, and even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. And God said unto him in a dream, yea, I know that thou did this in the integrity of thy heart. For I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore I suffered thee not to touch her. God restrained that man because he had been duped by Sarah and Abraham. They lied to him. You know, the desire of the psalmist was direction from God for his life and to not do anything that would hurt his relationship with the Lord. He said, he said Lord, Order my steps by your word. Psalm 119, 133. Order my steps in thy word and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. It was a prayer. Lord, help me to not do anything stupid and wrong. Lord, I don't want to do anything that's going to hurt my walk with you. You know, that would be a good prayer for us to pray every day. You know, the scriptures will help you to do what is right. And... and they will hinder you from doing wrong if you will obey them. You know, Psalm 119.11, Thy words have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. John 15.3, Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Psalm 37.31, the law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. The scriptures, God's word, will have a huge impact in your life if you will make them a part of your life. If you will first read it, take time each day to read God's word and then put it into practice. Uh, Pastor George Truett said, To know the will of God is the greatest knowledge. To do the will of God is the greatest achievement. Uh, that, that the great man of God, A.T. Pearson, said, To go as I am led, to go when I am led, to go where I am led, it is that which hath been for 20 years the one prayer of my life. You know, David Jaculo said, the most important thing in life is knowing the most important things in life. That's a great statement. The most important thing in life is your salvation and your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ for your salvation? Are you living for the Lord Jesus Christ? If you're here this morning and you don't know if you're going to go to heaven when you die, you can know before you leave church today by trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior. Not join in that church, not any works that you do, because your works are never good enough. 
But the Bible says if you'll put your faith in the Son of God, I'm asking Him to forgive you and cleanse you of your sin. If you'll turn from your sin and put your faith in Him for salvation, He will save you. He will give you His gift of eternal life. That's His promise. So if you don't know that today, you can know before you leave church by trusting Jesus as your Savior. Make sure that nothing in your priorities keep you from coming to God and obeying the Lord in your life. See, the Lord likes to be number one in our lives. He doesn't want to be second or last place. He doesn't want to be on the back burner of the stove. He wants to be number one in our lives. Good question right now is, is Jesus Christ number one in your life? Matthew 6, 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. If Balaam would do what Balak requested, the king said he would promote him to honor. Understand, beloved, that true promotion comes from God himself. The king may have promoted Balaam, but the prophet, he didn't live very long after that. God is the one who sets up one, and God is the one who takes down another. Psalm 75, 6. For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south, but God is the judge. By the way, you and I are going to have to answer to him one day. We're going to give an account of our lives to him. He putteth down one and setteth up another. So let me ask, which promotion do you seek in your life? Is it the world's popularity and promotion, or is it God's promotion that you desire in your life? Do you seek God's glory in your life? No flesh, the Bible says, no flesh should glory in His presence. No flesh should glory in His presence because He is the Creator of the universe who grabbed the dust of the earth made by his hands and made us into his own image no flesh should glory in his presence because he is the conqueror of Satan who bruised his head at Calvary and sealed the eternal destiny of Satan in the lake of fire. No flesh should glory in his presence because he is the culmination of all power. Our Lord cannot be dented, distracted, or destroyed. By his words, this world was spoken into his existence and by his words, he can destroy those who defy him. No flesh should glory in his presence because he has confirmed and proven his love and compassion for the entire human race by giving his only begotten son to pay for the price of man's wickedness. No flesh should glory in his presence because he alone is the conqueror of death, confirming that his word is true. He provides security for us if we entrust the treasure of our soul to him. He will save and keep us for all eternity. He has done all things, and no flesh should glory in his presence. Do you know him today? If not, then trust Christ as your Savior. And if you know Christ as your Savior, if you're a Christian, then make it a point each day to bring honor and glory to Jesus Christ in your life. That should be the priority of our life.